With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union, the Cold War certainly seemed like it had ended. But Russia continues to threaten the United States' political system through cyber and social media. It's invaded countries on its borders, and it maintains a large nuclear arsenal. Meanwhile, the rest of Europe is confronting crises like the rise of right-wing populism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and a fraying European Union. What does all this mean for the United States, and what can we learn from Cold War history? This is Snack Break. I'm Marwa Mukherjee, and today we're pleased to have Dr. Mary Cerati, the Kravis Professor of Historical Studies at Johns Hopkins Sice. She's written several fantastic award-winning books on the end of the Cold War. Professor Cerati, thank you so much for being here. Sure. Thank you for inviting me. So the Cold War, did the Cold War really end? Because it still feels pretty <laughs> chilly. That's why I wore my, my Christmas tie. <laughs> That question comes up ever more frequently nowadays, which for someone who lived through the end of the Cold War is in and of itself heartbreaking. I uh, was a student, I was doing study abroad in West Berlin in 1989. In 1989? In 1989. Oh my God. And it was hard to believe that the Cold War, the thermonuclear standoff that it cast such a shadow over, of course, not only my childhood, but of course, everyone on earth, right. that it was going to come to an end peacefully. It was just such an era of optimism at that time. And so alone the fact that here we are asking this question again is heartbreaking because it was such an optimistic era then. I mean, what, to what extent does the world, in, in your eyes, to what mm -hmm. extent uh, being in Berlin uh, in, in 1989. West Berlin. West Berlin West in Berlin. 1989. To what extent does the world today still reflect uh, that pre-1989 world? Well, there's, uh, wh what is the saying? History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Obviously, the Cold War in its 20th century version is gone, right? We had this ideological conflict between the West and the Communist Soviet Union. The Communist Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. So obviously, that conflict is gone. Uh, that ideological component of the struggle between communism and capitalism, that's also decreased. You still have it at least in name with China, but that is a little bit of a different case. So obviously there are huge differences, but there are important continuities, most importantly in the person of Vladimir Putin, who was raised in the Soviet Union and was a KGB agent. There's uh, some important work done in political science by Alexander George on the notion of operational codes, and I found that very useful in my own research. He's a presidential uh, communications uh, political George, scientist, yeah. A professor of political science, correct. That's right. And one of his many writings talks about how leaders have operational codes that are formed when they're young, in their 20s generally, at the latest, and they then put them into effect much later when they're in power. So there's this time lag between the formation of their mental worlds and then the implementation. A classic example tends to be Ronald Reagan. Uh, the formation of his mental world is in the McCarthyite era. Uh, it, when he's in Hollywood, seeing the world in very black and white, very, very Manichaean terms, but then when he becomes president in the 80s, in many ways he implements that view. Ah, see, so, so with Putin, the theory would be that because of Putin's past in the 80s, or 70s, I guess, when he was in his, uh, when he was his 20s and 30s, that uh, worldview, that KGB era worldview has greatly informed his his uh, rhetoric and policy today. Absolutely, and he was also in Germany in 1989. He was posted to Dresden, and I've seen some of the paperwork from, that uh, showed his communications with the Stasi at that time. He, of course, was a KGB agent posted in Dresden, and he was on the scene of some of the biggest mass protests in East Germany at the time. And this is a man with a long memory. He saw street protests and saw them overwhelming the regime and said, that's not gonna happen on my watch. And so in the first instance, he personally defended the KGB office in Dresden, which is unusual because the Stasi building got overrun, you know, a lot of other buildings got overrun, but not the KGB office. Vladimir Putin threatened violence and defended the KGB office and burnt all of the documents that he could in the furnace in the building, breaking it, actually. So he had this mentality even then of, I will not yield to the crowds. And this mentality, I think, then kicked in when you fast forward to late 2011, 2012, when there are protests in Moscow, street protests test. He's thinking, I've seen this movie before, mm -hmm. and this is not something I'm going to let get out of hand. So I think you very much see in, in his person, you see learning from the Cold War being implemented in a leadership role. So that's just one of the many ways there are still continuities today. Interesting. And it's, some people also say that uh, Putin you know, desires, wants, wants to, longs for the Russia of the past. It's, 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 it's these sorts of experiences, but also this kind of more romantic notion of his country itself. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's playing into his policies as well? Sometimes there are, there are other arguments that actually Putin just wants to 
uh, be rich and powerful. And he's thinking of things day to day. He these are not kind of grand visions that he has. How, how do you balance those those two? No, I think the concept of Russia's past weighs very heavily on him. Although Russia experts speculate whether that's the Soviet Union or Tsarist Russia going even farther back in time. He has said, Putin famously, uh, repeatedly, that the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now think about that for the moment. There's a lot of competition for that title, unfortunately. But he has said that the greatest pol geopolitical catastrophe in the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's how profoundly he regrets Because it, it created instability or, is that is that just a personal embarrassment or, or collective embarrassment? I think in his view, it toppled a great nation, the nation that defeated the Nazis, a nation that was a bedrock of stability. Usually the word stability comes up in these discussions. His home, the Russian nation, that that has created all of these problems and uncertainty in the modern era. You would, of course, have to ask him to get the uh, uh, exact reasons behind it. But it's clear that he regrets that greatly. One thing about Russia and, and Russia's um, you know, over the last 20 years or 25 years since the end of the Cold War, um, that uh, is this idea that, that, that Russia is a monster of our own, own making. Mm -hmm. That Russia, and this is certainly a story that's told um, uh, by Putin from his perspective that the U.S. instead of incorporating Russia into the fold, it uh, it expanded NATO mm -hmm. and uh, led Russia to feel threatened and insecure. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any um, accuracy uh, or credibility in that idea? Well, I at first, I don't think Putin would say Russia is a monster of American making. Oh, right. I well, don't think Putin would say that. Uh, I think Putin would certainly condemn the United States for a variety of reasons, but he would always assert the independence and autonomy of Russia itself. The question of uh, NATO expansion is a tricky one. As you know, this is one of my research interests. And in the course of my research on German unification, which happened in 1989, 1990, so earlier than you generally think, NATO expansion would come up. When I was researching that topic, I was surprised to find a number of documents that did allude to the possibility of NATO expansion. And as you know, I've published a variety of books and articles on this topic. So the question of NATO moving eastward beyond the 1989 Cold War border, that question comes up already at the beginning of 1990. And so it's been an issue in U.S.-Russian relations for the entirety of the post-Cold War era. And there's been ebbs and flows. So there's been times when Russia has been more upset about it and times when Russia has been less upset about it. That seems to correlate with the economic performance of the Russian economy. Uh, when the price of oil is high, when the Russian economic performance is solid, uh, then uh, there's less need to, just shall we say, distract public attention by vilifying the West. So there have been ebbs and flows, but it has been a constant and has been a constant irritant, especially at the elite level. And certainly in the last four or five years, as the oil price has stayed low, as Putin has decided to move aggressively into Crimea and Ukraine, it's certainly risen to the forefront. So uh, it seems that, roughly speaking, Putin has had sort of two two deals with the Russian people. Earlier on when he first came to office, it was, we're going to improve your standard of living. Elections will be kind of corrupt, but your standard of living is going to improve. So as long as you don't complain, as long as you're not Mikhail Kordakovsky, you can live a decent life. Just let, you know, leave politics to the experts. Mm -hmm. Let Russia be run by the people who own it. Thank you very much. And then uh, everything will be fine. That worked for a while. Then the economy starts to nosedive. And so now you have a new deal, which is, we're going to return to imperial grandeur. We're going to rally around the flag. We're going to, you know, oppose an enemy, and that seems to be going on more now. And so we're in that phase. That's when NATO expansion really comes to a, a head as an issue. I mean, this this uh, this idea that it has to do more with d Russia's domestic situation is reminds me of Kennan's long telegram in mm -hmm. 1946, where he reoriented, uh, where he's credited for reorienting U.S. policy. Uh, by saying, hey, no, 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 the reason why Russia is acting the way it is mm -hmm. is not because of what we're doing, and he was he was based in Moscow, uh, it, it's because of Russia's domestic mm -hmm. uh, situation. They want to maintain control, and you do that by vilifying the West. So would you say uh, Kennan's kind of thesis, if that's, you know, if we, we mm -hmm. say that's the kind of the, the takeaway, that that still is the case today, that they are still vilifying the West in so, for, the, for, the, for the major reason of, of trying to maintain power and mm -hmm. to... Uh, to avert, uh, divert attention away from, from low oil prices and, and, and a bad economy. But I think that's certainly part of it. 
I, I often say as a historian, the only phenomenon I've never witnessed is monocausality. Anything important happens for a variety of reasons. So uh, it, I would never say X happened because of Y reason. That's 100% of the causation. So clearly there's a mixture of domestic concerns, but genuine foreign policy resentment. So it's some mixture in there. Uh, I just um, reviewed Michael McFall's new book, From Cold War to Hot Peace, for the Financial Times. And Michael McFall addresses this issue, I think, well. He talks about the prevalence of these domestic political issues. And I think he's right that that probably is the predominant aspect. But certainly, there is genuine friction over NATO expansion. And I would say particularly to former Soviet republics. Uh, that seems to have particularly created a grievance in Putin's mind, that NATO didn't just move eastward, that it actually moved into the former Soviet sphere, which Moscow considers to be its near abroad. Moscow feels that it should have a say over those states in a special way, more so than over Central and Eastern Europe. So those are genuine foreign policy grievances, but they combine with the domestic factors that we were just discussing. Well, and so, and so I'm getting on to Europe. You just mentioned Eastern Europe. Europe right now is also uh, generally speaking, doesn't seem like it's a huge fan of the United States. It's certainly not our <laughs> allies, and, and that's because of our. You know, Trump has has withdrawn from the uh, or has announced withdrawal from the uh, from the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran. That's and the, the Iran, Paris Accord. Paris Accord last, yeah. and he's also you know right. said not nice things about NATO and the UN, and right. um, of right. course that has made. But uh, does does Europe feel? Lonely? Does it feel neglected right now? <laughs> Does it feel lonely? Well, e Europe, as you know, consists of many countries, and they keep More each other. One. They keep <laughs> each other company. So, uh, the issue of anti-Americanism is a tricky one. If we were still in the Obama era and we were talking about anti-Americanism, I would have to differentiate between the elite level and the popular level. So, at the popular level, absolutely, you had anti-Americanism that hit historic highs during the Iraq War that never really receded. Uh, you then had renewed anti-Americanism over TTIP, over the trade agreement. There were street protests against it. You had a, a lot of popular expressions of anti-Americanism. But at the elite level in the Obama era, the cooperation was terrific. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Kerry and Frank Walter Steinmeier as foreign minister could not have worked more closely together, for example. So at the elite level, uh, you had very good relations, particularly with Germany, but also with other European countries. So there was almost this, this disconnect. Mm -hmm. What seems to be happening now is the European elites, Germany and France, have been trying to keep that transatlantic spirit of American-European cooperation alive, but it's faltering f uh, for lack of interest on the part of the Trump administration. And for lack of anyone sitting behind any desks at the State Department. Yeah. I just heard this morning that uh, Mike Pompeo finally lifted the hiring freeze that's been in place, yeah. either de facto or de jure, since Tillerson came into office. It's now, you know, May 2018. Yeah, they might actually be able to have some more new Foreign Service officers. They might actually be able to <laughs> fill some of these empty yeah. ambassadorships, assistance. <laughs> and and assistance are states, right. they just don't have. So there's that's this right. constant refrain among European diplomats mm -hmm. with whom I speak, you know, no one answers the phone, right? Uh, so you have this elite yeah. cooperation breaking down. And, and then just recently, Angela Merkel, just this week in public remarks, has said a lot about uh, you know, the U.S. in essence is no longer a reliable partner for us. Uh, there was a lot of friction about the very late announcement that the waivers would be extended uh, on the, um, the trade sanctions. That's right. And it, not only the fact that, that that threat is there, but it was like midnight the night before they were supposed to come into effect that another waiver came out and it's another short-term solution. They don't like the drama. They don't like, they don't like the drama. Put, yeah, they don't the like string. the fact that no one answers the phone. They don't like the so fact is, that- is, is, this, is this something that's, are we seeing a seeing a split here that's a long-term, you know, is it just Trump? I'm, I guess I'm just wondering, is this something that is, uh, that Europe or in the United States, that we were, they're seeing each other less as strategic priorities? Certainly the transatlantic relationship is at greater risk now than at any time in my life. The, as I said, elite level used to persist through waves of anti-Americanism. And the recent one, by the way, is hardly unique. There was uh, another wave in the early 80s concerning stationing of nuclear missiles in Europe. There are waves during the Vietnam War. This is not new, but 
there were these elite relationships in the transatlantic partnership that carried the relationship through to better days. And it worries me deeply that those are breaking down, whether through uh, a lack of someone sitting at a desk as, at the State Department or through someone sitting at a desk who's, who's hostile to European leaders. And that, I think, is worrisome because if the elite level transatlantic partnership is breaking down and there's anti-Americanism at the popular level, you then, then do start to see a meaningful bifurcation. Obviously, you know, the big question is what happens in the midterm elections? What happens in the next presidential elections? Can this be reversed? And I hope very much that it will be because I believe the transatlantic partnership is hugely important, right? To paraphrase Winston Churchill, we're the worst allies except for all the others. <laughs> so I think that the transatlantic partnership is one of the triumphs of the 20th century and I worry about it right today. It is snack time now. Snack time. Because so, I've been thinking about those chocolates for the whole of the last 20 minutes. Um, so your your favorite snack is uh, or, uh, some chocolate, chocolate Anything oriented. Anything with chocolate so we, in it, yes. That's very fun, kind of you. We, we, have, uh, we have a chocolate tasting board. Oh, for goodness sake. Um, which is really exciting. Yes. Um, so these come from a, a local place called Cardulo's in, in Harvard Square. And dairy milk is not actually local. However, uh, the Taza chocolate is um, is 70%. We just, I, I, needed, I wanted to get a, a variety of uh, <laughs> per percentages. So one of You're my favorite. You're a good favorite, man. You're so a good man, is, uh, Thank you. So this is Guitard, which is a San Francisco-based company. This is, uh -huh. It's 91%, so it's a little on the higher end. Okay. I'm a big fan of that. This yeah. is 75. Yeah. I'm sure dairy milk is like 40. Uh, <laughs> we've got a vanilla cream, whoopie pie, shortbread, yes. a regular chocolate cookie, and a peanut butter wow. uh, chocolate cookie. Too bad so your viewers can't jump join into right the now. screen well, and join <laughs> right in. You've got enough for a whole, a whole so, yeah, audience there. Uh, Should uh, we yeah. break a cookie? What do oh, you think? Oh, yeah, go over after you. Yeah, take All right, your pick. Well, I'll, take, I'll, I'll take, take over a cookie. Yeah, it sounds great. All right. Um, Hello, viewers. Sorry you, can't, <laughs> sorry you can't share it. I'm being 100% serious here. If the world had more chocolate, <laughs> would we see fewer problems in, in diplomacy? More European, more European chocolate. More European more chocolate. More Belgian chocolate. <laughs> so, well, I mean, if you take that to a, you know, more generalization, if you, you know, when the economy is doing well, yeah. a lot of other things seem to work. And when the economy is not doing well, a lot of other things don't seem to work, right? We talked about this at the beginning of the mm -hmm. conversation. It seems that Putin's level of demonization of NATO corresponds to the status of the Russian economy, right? That's right. So if you take uh, prevalence of chocolate, mm -hmm. or you take the Big Mac index, yeah. right? This is a, a, a way of... Tell me about that, yeah. <laughs> it's a way of assessing the price of goods in a comparable way across multiple states. Okay. So because obviously that's a comparable product, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the price of that product in different places, that tells you something about the state of the economy. I see. Right. So if you take a product and talk about its availability, that's what you're really talking about that is a, a symbol or a token for the economic health of an area and what it costs to have desirable consumer goods. And if you know society is feeling economic pain, then there are all kinds of consequences, but I'm not. I'm not saying anything. No, uh, that <laughs> dozens of theorists, hundreds of theorists. I mean, have could, could chocolate turn back the tide of right-wing populism? <laughs> right now, that's a real question. But seriously, because so here's here's a weird thing: uh, is that uh, with 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 about you know populism in Europe, uh, of course, it's on the rise. Right-wing populism. Mm -hmm. uh, is that it's also on the rise in Poland, which is so funny because Poland actually weathered the uh, financial crisis uh, mm -hmm. better than other European nations. It makes me think there's also a uh, and I had just a conversation with. Uh, somebody the other day about it, mm. uh, that there's a cultural element too to this. Uh, they're saying, you know, uh, it's not, it's, it is in large part uh, uh, the, uh, a response to uh, a bad economy. However, there's, there's a source of these. Poland like, is the one place that hasn't had a recession. Poland was not hit right. by Well, this is why it's no weird. Nine. Yeah, that's why I think, how, well, how do you explain Poland, right? That's the, that's the question. How do you explain right-wing populism in Poland or, you know, the protests they had in November? Um, yeah, that, that is an interesting question. There was, there's an interesting article in, I believe it's the current issue of foreign affairs by Ivan Krastev talking specifically about that question, mm -hmm. about how do you explain populism in Poland, which has done well economically. Right. So is a, a countervailing example to what I was just saying. Mm -hmm. And his argument, I'm still thinking through this, but his argument is that it has to do with immigration. So his argument, again, this is Ivan Krastev, I'm mm -hmm. paraphrasing here, right. is that his argument is that Poland is unique because when the wall came down, uh, when the EU and particularly the UK opened up all kinds of labor mobility possibilities for Poles, mm -hmm. a sizable chunk of Poles moved west. So there was emigration out of the country with a sense among the stay behinds that somehow they were the less smart population. Mm -hmm. So Ivan Krasta. Then add to that 
influx, a perceived influx of immigration. I see. Um, one of the paradoxes, of course, is that resistance to immigrants actually tends to be greatest in areas that receive the fewest of them. That's what's crazy. Which is crazy, but yep. there's this. But, but setting aside facts and talking about perceptions. That's right. Right. You have this perception, mm -hmm. not fact, but perception mm -hmm. that the whole country is being overwhelmed by immigrants. That's right. So Krostov's argument is that there's the sense in Poland that the good people mm -hmm. left and the bad people are showing up, and therefore the only way to resist mm -hmm. is to just toss democratic norms out the window and lock the gates and draw, draw the drawbridge. That's right. So this is his argument. I'm still thinking about mm -hmm. it, but it, it is a, a, a way of bringing in other factors beside the economic right. argument, which is not so much the case in Poland, which has actually had a terrific run. It certainly passes the smell test uh, in terms of just intuitively it feels, okay, I could see that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Poland, by the way, is also 90 some odd percent ethnic Pole. Uh, Catholic. And, yeah, and so it's, it isn't uh, a, a very diverse country. But you wonder uh, when you hear about w the places in the UK where Brexit was most popular, or uh, even immigration sentiments elsewhere, they tend to be less concerned about it in big cities where you have lots of interaction between mm -hmm. all sorts of people. Uh, so intuitively, I feel like there's, 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 there's something there. Mm -hmm. um, As I said, I don't believe in monocausality. Yes, yeah, right. So I think there's a whole bunch of factors that come together. There's also there, historically, a lot of people who also grew up during the Cold War, and not all of them were in favor of solidarity, right? So, um, those, those leaders of solidarity, Lech Valenza, they were in prison for a long time. They didn't put themselves in those prisons. So you have you know, people who were not supporters of the changes that came, and that mentality persists. We were also talking about that as well. You have operational codes that were formed in an undemocratic state. It's hard. It takes a long time to change. It takes a long time to change, yeah. and sometimes you never do. And sometimes these mm -hmm. operational codes, as we were discussing before, manifest themselves later. And so I, I think in some ways that's that's what we're seeing. I think that's another factor coming into this mix. Well, Professor Sarati, thank you so much for joining. Sure. It's been an absolute sure. pleasure. Right. This is Snack Break. I'm Arup Mukherjee, and today we had Dr. Mary Sarati the Kravis Professor of Historical Studies at Johns Hopkins Sice. To view more episodes, please visit our website at snackbreakshow.com.